So, <laughs> 16 years ago, our next guest started her, her eponymous jewelry company in her spare bedroom with $500 from her bank account. It's now a billion dollar company, and the primary pillars of family, fashion, and philanthropy have shaped her business, culture, and decision making. She attributes dreaming big, being disruptive, and hiring the right people as the cornerstones of her success. Please welcome Kendra Scott with Fortune's Patty Sellers. Thank you, Lee. Yay. I've got my tea, y'all. I, I lost my voice Saturday and Sunday, so I'm going to sip my, sip my tea. And tell them what your, your five-year-old son said Well, about. he was so cute. He's like, so my, my husband told my five-year-old, Mommy lost her voice. And he's like, Mommy, where did you lose it? <laughs> and then this morning when I was talking much better, he's like, Mommy, I'm so happy you found your voice. <laughs> like, it was just hiding. It's been hiding. <laughs> <laughs> so as Lee Gallagher said, Kendra Scott started her company in 2002 with no money, $500 in a spare bedroom. Kendra, you did not bring in outside capital until 2013. 13. Why is that? Because I didn't know where to find it. <laughs> It was, you know, it was, when I started, it really was, a sur it was survival in a lot of ways. I loved jewelry and fashion since I was a little girl. I had a newborn baby that I had just brought home from the hospital, and I desperately wanted to be a present mother and do what I love and pay my bills. It really was not this big, ma you know, big master grand plan. And so when we started to gain momentum, I realized I needed to tr figure out funding. Um, and I didn't know where to find investors. You know, we are in Austin, Texas. You know, it was a different time period than it is now. I and mean, we would even just access on the internet of, you know, locating angels or things like that just weren't accessible in 2002. Um, and so I went to the bank and I got a simple line of credit. I put everything I owned up for collateral. The beginning days of my business, I mean, thank goodness for MasterCard. Um, you know, they were, that was a big part of my funding. And it was kind of a bootstrap business. And, you know, everything that we would make, I'd kind of try to, you know, put back into the business as I could. Um, I was able to use my orders that I was getting in in the early days and use those as collateral to the bank to increase my line of credit. So for those first few, you know, oh, many years, um, it was all done through debt. And you were, at certain points, you had, you had split with your husband, you had two sons, now you have three, yeah. and you were pretty much living hand to mouth. Very much. I and mean, when I got divorced, um, the boys were one in three. And I had this business that, you know, I was just getting off the ground. It was not making money. I mean, we were seeing some successes, but I was barely paying myself, you know, anything. Um, the boys and I were living on $200 a week. And I remember what that felt like, how I was going to manage groceries and everything I needed to do for them without them feeling it. Um, my sister moved in with me, thank God for family, to help pay for rent and help me when I could. My mom was there to help me get the boys to and from school. And, you know, I just had this village of amazing friends and family that supported me during that time. But it was really, really hard. And I remember thinking, I need to find someone to help me with this business. But the business wasn't making enough money that anybody was interested in investing. So if you could have architected that differently from 2002 to 2013, would you have? Or was surviving on bank loans and the kindness of friends the best way to build this company? <laughs> I don't know if it was the best way. It was definitely a stressful way, let's put it that way. There were lots of sleepless nights. There were many times I would just cry on my floor and be like, how am I gonna do this? Um, you know, I had a landlord, so we moved from the extra bedroom into an attic space. It was this little house on, on, uh, in Austin. It was an office, but there was a thundercloud subs, and they owned this building, and that was their office, and he had attic space for rent. And so he leased the attic to me. And Mike is like the greatest guy who, if you're ever and you see a thundercloud, eat a thundercloud sub because this guy saved me. <laughs> so I would go down to Mike and I'd be like, Mike, 
So I'm waiting on Nordstrom's check. It should be here like any day. If you could just hold my rent check for a few days, I will let you know when you can deposit it. And him being an entrepreneur and young, like cool, oh, Kendra, I know you're good for it. Don't worry about it. Just let me know when you're ready and I'll deposit it kind of thing. But it was all of those elements that helped. So your question of what I would have done it differently. I think when I, when I took my first investor in 2013, I took a friend who had been an advisor and a mentor to me. Because I didn't have a typical board, because it was just me, I wanted to bring in advisors that were really amazing and smart and brilliant that I could learn from. And I wanted to have almost a cadence of going into a board and getting that feedback from them. So I put together an advisory group. One of my advisors was like, please, Kendra, let me invest in you. Mm -hmm. And so I sold him 5% of the company in 2013. And it was the first time I had sold any equity. And I was terrified, but I also felt OK with this decision because it was a trusted friend. It was someone I admired and respected so much. And he had always been a cheerleader for me. And so it felt good to know that I could have somebody across the table. And suddenly, the pressure that I had been holding on my shoulders all of those years started to lessen a little bit. And I had someone that I felt like I could actually hold hands with and say, what should we do? And I never was able to do that before. It was always, Kendra, what are you going to do? And you know, now I had at least someone else across the table. So, Yes, if I would have and could have brought that on earlier, I think mm -hmm. I would have. And it would have taken a lot of stress away that I think I face. But in the long run, everything worked out the way it was supposed to. And then now you, you brought in uh, a private equity partner this year, Berkshire Partners, um, at a valuation of just over a billion. Just over a billion dollars. <laughs> no. Patty, I swear to you guys, so we're getting all these valuations are coming in. Okay, this is a girl who started this out of her bedroom. Okay, guys? And they're like, Kendra, the valuations are coming in. They're coming in at about a billion. And I was like, I'm, I'm sorry. Did, did that have a B on it? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, because the only B that I had kind of ever been familiar with was the potential of bankruptcy prior to this. <laughs> so I was just like, what? Yeah. So how did you, why? Why did you decide to bring in a yep. bigger investor at this point, and how did you decide on who that investor would be? So after my small investor, we actually brought in a PE firm for 20% the following year okay. of the company, uh, Norwest Venture Partners. Amazing woman-led fund. Um, they were fantastic partners because I really started to see then where our business was going, where we are in revenue, the things that we needed, the resources we needed, the connections, frankly, that we needed, uh, the foundations that we needed to put in place for our growth. We need to have a partner that could help us get there that had done that with other businesses. So bringing in Norwest was really a great bridge. And during those years from 2014 to 2017, those three years, we really, it was like lightning in a bottle growth and so fortunate to have awesome partners that, again, we had a very aligned vision. We did not have a plan at that point to do another raise so quickly, but the business was going so, you know, growing so fast. And I knew, again, we were in a place where sometimes you outgrow that group and you're ready for the next group, right? And that's where we were. We were ready for a group that could help us with international expansion, that really had helped other brands in their growth. I wanted somebody who could sit across the table for an extended period of time. So I didn't want somebody that was you know, in the later stages of a fund. I wanted somebody that could sit with us for at least seven years. Mm -hmm. um, again, we had to share my core values. We had to have an aligned vision. We didn't have to do it. We were really fortunate in the stage where we were that we didn't have to, to do this. It was more of an exercise of could we find a really great partner? And if we could, we may be interested to do it. And what is the thing that you do? I don't know if there is a thing. But the thing that you do or the thing that you ask to assess whether this is someone I want to be have as an equity partner and you know, bet my, bet my company on. I mean, it was a, it's a big deal. My core values are family, fashion, and philanthropy. Um, I was a mom when I started this. I love fashion, and I wanted to do something good. 
And so for me, when I hire someone, whether it's a vendor or an employee or a PE firm that we're going to bring on, I look at their core values and they have to align with mine. Um, we have to have the same aligned destination of where we're going. Uh, if, we di if we were at all different in that, it wasn't going to work. We were going to have conflict. And I think those elements are really, really important. You know, I always hire on heart before resume. And you know, the same thing with this. I sat across and I looked at them and I looked at their heart just as much as I looked at their portfolio of different businesses. And I talked with the other businesses that they worked with to see not just how they are when things are good, but what does it look like when things go bad? How do they respond across the table to you? Are they really being helpful and you know supportive and collaborative or are they being aggressive and domineering? And you know, and I wanted to know those things. And I think asking a lot of questions and really taking the time to get to know them, not just in a boardroom, go ahead having lunch with them, go having coffee with them, finding out about their families. I met all of their spouses. Um, I wanted to see what they were like as humans. And when I knew that, then I knew that they could be a good partner. Who has a question? Don't be afraid. <laughs> <laughs> all right, I'm going to ask another one. Kendra, you have inside Kendra Scott, the, uh, the original, your first seven employees. The super seven. Still with you. Yep, the super how, seven. How did you manage to do that? Well, they're my sisters. I mean, not my real sisters. But seriously. They're the sisters you get to pick. Well, one of them is my mom. One of so them is she's, she definitely, um, you know. She, now, your mom is an employee. Yes. And yes. what does she do? What is her title? So, well, she's like, they call her mom. Mama Janet. Um, she's the title of she's whatever she wants to be whenever she wants to be it as she puts it she gave birth to the company literally <laughs> she reminds everybody of that all the time she's like I just want you to know I gave birth to this company literally I'm like, okay mama Janet but she was with me I mean when I started this you know I, I, many of you may have heard the story about her being in my dining room we're ticketing and tagging an order for Nordstrom, and they call, and I mean, I am totally faking it till I made it, folks. Like, the, I was like, yeah, we got a distribution center, my dining room, who needs to know the details, you know? <laughs> and my mom's down there ticketing and carding, and they're like, they're, they call, and they're like, we need to speak with somebody in your fulfillment and distribution center, and I'm like, oh my god. So I was like, oh, sure, no problem, hold please. And I'm like, mom, I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> Nordstrom's on the phone and they want somebody in shipping and receiving and so she like very calmly picks up like the cordless phone downstairs in 2003 <laughs> you know it's like with the wire coming out of it and she's like shipping and receiving this is Janet you know like <laughs> cool as a cucumber I mean we she's amazing and so she, we did everything like she did everything she helped me set up you know, booths for market. She helped me ship orders. She was customer service. She would go after people who were paying late on their bills. I mean, we did everything. The seven, the six other girls, they were design. Started some started as a design assistant. She's now VP of design. Um, been with me for 14 years. Um, you know, it's an amazing group. And I think you know we were family, and we held hands when things were tough. And we celebrated when things were good. We were honest. We were transparent. We all knew what we wanted to accomplish. We all went through a lot of personal things together from you know, bringing babies to all of us had brought our babies into the office. We would pass our babies around to each other. We had pack and plays everywhere. I mean, I don't even know what was going on. We were, it was like we were surviving and we were making our own world of what we wanted. And now we have over 2,000 employees 95% are women, many of them are mothers, and those seven of us created this world that we wanted now for all of these other women, and I think that's what is most unbelievable for all of us every day. Like, we can't. So you have 94 stores now? Yes. 94 yeah. stores across the country. Yeah. Um, as well as a presence in... This is why I have laryngitis. <laughs> I'm calling, it's a holiday. I'm calling all of them, trying to get into the stores. Fantastic. Yeah, this is, you know, my, my family are farmers, and my, you know, they, that saying, you make hay while the sun shines. I'm making hay right now. I gotta, <laughs> I gotta get out. This is holiday. So, when the recession happened in two, 10 years ago, in 2008, you were completely wholesale. You yes. did not have any retail stores. Correct. Um, 
looking back on it and you realized you needed a direct connection with the consumer. Yes. Would it have been smart to go retail early? You know what? I think earlier. No, you know, I think it was actually, I think it again, it all kind of fell into place the way it was supposed to. The recession was a great gift because it woke me up. Like I couldn't, I was trying to play it safe. You know, wholesale was safe. I could write an order, I'd ship an order, they'd sell the order. It was easy until the recession hit. And then all of a sudden, all my eggs were in one basket and they had the power. So if the buyers were laid off that I had built a relationship, they had the power to not write the orders. Or the boutiques that I had sold to for years were shuddering. Every morning I'd wake up and I'd hear of another store, another store closing. All of my power was lost because I didn't have direct conversation with my customer. I was so worried about what the buyers wanted and the store owners wanted, I forgot what was most important and it was the conversation with the customer directly. And, and it was a wake up call of that's gotta become my priority because if the customer loves it, if the customer is happy, she will demand your product in those stores. She will demand it wherever she goes. So the conversation for our company was we're gonna redirect our focus. Not that we stopped selling wholesale, but the focus became direct to consumer. And you were with Amazon for a few years and you ended your relationship with Amazon last year. Why? Well, you know, <laughs> she loves, they love getting in there, don't they? <laughs> um, well, Amazon is great. <laughs> and, um, no, you know what, I, look, I told you this even backstage, I love competition. I do, like it gets me excited because it makes us have to be better. So with our dot com, Amazon is challenging me. How do I get my products to my customers within two days? How do I make the return super easy? How do I make checkout faster and more convenient? Like I love that it's making us be better. In the same light, I also want to be protective of our customer experience. No one is going to have a better customer experience when then they come into our doors or if they go to my.com. I can control that experience for them. I want them to have the butterfly release when a package gets to their house. I couldn't control that on Amazon. And the other thing for me is if I'm going to give, do have a wholesale partner, which is already lower margin business, there has to be an advantage to doing that. Right, and there, if if in you know I'm on an, like let's say Selfridges as an example in London, what a great partner they are. People are discovering Kendra Scott for the very first time that have never heard of that brand. Going to Selfridges.com, they're learning about a brand. On Amazon, you go to Amazon, you type in exactly what you want. There's not a lot of discovery of new brands, and I felt like there was a lot less cons than there were pros for us to continue. Mm -hmm. um, Kendra gave a really great commencement speech this year at UT. <laughs> the at the girl University who didn't of graduate Texas. graduate from college. <laughs> so my mom was backstage, Mama Janet. Oh my God, she's like crying. I go, Mom, I'm not actually, because I had the cap and gown. I'm, I'm not <laughs> getting a diploma. Like, she was so, she's like, I gotta get a picture. Like, she's getting all the pictures. She's sending them. I'm like, people are gonna be very confused. But. <laughs> It was the closest she'll ever Fake get to it the until you make it. Yeah, but I got the I got the whole thing. I had the whole regalia on. Yeah. So you said, Kendra, culture is brand. Yeah. Explain that. You know, I think today when you're building a business, your culture of your of 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 what you're creating, you know, ours is so much our core values. And it's in every single thing we do. It's in how we execute our stores from having community outreach managers who are engaged within the community. And part, philanthropy is such a big part. It's not just lip service. When you walk into our offices, you see babies in a kid's room and mother's nursing rooms. And we create this and foster an environment of family. We have a sister rule. We treat each other like sisters and brothers. And it's very easy to treat a customer and figure out a customer problem when you say, treat them like your sister. Well, if your sister lost her earrings, what would you do? One earring. You'd let her buy another pair at 50% off. I would. If your sister broke her necklace, wouldn't you fix it? Of course you would. If your sister was having a hard time at home and she was at the office and she needed some help because her child was sick, wouldn't you cover for her? Of course you would. And so it makes this environment that we've created really holistic in every place you walk in, whether it's our distribution center, our home office, our Kendra Scott stores, you feel this feeling of love and kindness and warmth and acceptance. And those things matter, and they matter to brands. And you have to have a brand identity, and it has to be consistent 
all of the time. And any time you hire, those people have to be consistent in, in having that same, those same core values and culture. That would be my biggest set of advice. Hire on heart, always put that first, and you will win, for sure. It's a beautiful way to end, Kendra Scott. Thank you so much <laughs> for being so with us. Thank you so much. Thank you. Oh, thank you. That was great.